in the Rusi Whitehall paper, uh, Preparing for Peace, um, what we've been trying to do is to look at the record of the last 15 years of the government's engaging, engagement in fragile and failing states, uh, the way in which different departments have collaborated in, in order to uh, re-establish uh, semblance of order after major combat operations. And what we've sought to do is to examine uh, the successes, to look at where uh, the government has, uh, has developed initiatives that has helped it uh, to deliver effects on the ground, and where it has struggled to do so, where resources haven't been uh, forthcoming, where the kind of expertise required for the, the task hasn't been available. And what we've sought to do with the report is to look at all those experiences, look at all the initiatives that have been going on over the last 15 years, uh, and then summarize them and, and chart a, a way forward uh, so that over the next couple of years, even though there may not be another Iraq or another Afghanistan, the British government will be ready and will be prepared for the kind of challenges uh, it faces in stabilizing fragile states, uh, helping to prevent conflict, uh, and of course engaging uh, in reconstruction after major combat operations come to a conclusion. The report was produced um, through a series of in-depth interviews, uh, probably the largest number of interviews ever conducted on this subject, with not just officials, but former cabinet ministers, military officers, people who'd been out there on the ground doing some of the very important work of post-conflict stabilization, uh, as well as people uh, back in departments, uh, Department for International Development, the Foreign Office, the Ministry of Defense, and of course also the Cabinet Office, now called the National Security uh, Secretariat. Uh, and what we basically did was conduct a range of interviews with these people to understand what it is that they experienced, the problems, the opportunities, the, the things they'd like to see uh, change, and then uh, coupled that series of interviews with a range of desk studies where we surveyed all the big uh, reports out there, and in other words, all the literature that has been pr produced uh, in this field and put the two together. We started off by looking at what had been achieved over the last 15 years and identifying the out outstanding weaknesses. Undoubtedly there's a large number of areas where progress has been made. As the National Security Strategy of 2008-2009 produced a much better understanding of the threats to the UK security. We belatedly, admittedly, um, uh, developed a much better understanding of the circumstances we were facing in countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq and addressed the initial inconsistencies in our objectives. We applied the lessons from experience on the ground so that in, for example, Helmand, we produced the exemplar of all provincial reconstruction team in the way that the civilian and military sides came together in support of developing a legitimate government of Afghanistan. And we developed a much more robust cadre of individuals on the civilian side able to work in these environments. However, despite all this progress, there remain a, a large number of outstanding weaknesses there's still an innate tendency within the administration to mismatch ambition and resources. We still tend to believe that we can do more than we actually can achieve. The way that the funding systems have been built up still tend to favor immediate crisis response using the military rather than using the civilians to prevent future conflict. We still do not have a, a common understanding of what we mean by strategy. So Documents can be written to try and resolve the tensions between what the various parts of government want to do in a particular country. But all too often, they can end up just being a mere shopping list and don't resolve any fundamental tensions between different objectives across government. And we're still not quite there yet in having the assuredness that we can call on the, the kind of expertise we need in these challenging environments. And lastly, and most importantly, there's still a tendency for individuals in individual departments and in particular services to put the interests of that department or service first before those of government as a whole. And this reflects the department-specific nature of, of systems and most in particular of the career incentives. As a result, there is still a failure to achieve the coherence that we can across government. But what we're still lacking is a kind of cohesiveness across the government, an incentive structure for staff officers, officials, and to some extent even uh, elected politicians to collaborate much more than they're currently doing. And if there's one sort of central theme in the report, it's the need for a lot more collaboration to take place across various de departments. And for that to happen, greater incentives to be provided to officers and to officials to collaborate. 
Um, our, our report identifies a number of recommendations to improve that coherence across government, and including uh, a stronger sense of coordination at the center. And the National Security Council has already shown a number of signs that it is seeking to address some of those requirements. We, we make a number of other recommendations which have not yet been mentioned in the discussion around the Strategic Defense and Security Review. Uh, it's possible that some of our recommendations may be looked at after the SDSR is completed uh, as a second round of more detailed analysis is required to make the UK more effective in working in fragile states. The findings of the report are even more important in a time of austerity than hitherto. The recommendations cover engaging with fragile states in all respects, not just in terms of any interventions such as Iraq or Afghanistan. So they're about being much clearer about our priorities in these countries, about improving our understanding of these countries so we don't end up, end up engaging in a way that leads us to a commitment we never foresaw. And it's about making sure we have the right skills in the people that work on these countries so that we get the best value for money. Look at what the UK is doing in Afghanistan. If we look at how the UK is being clear about what it's trying to achieve in countries like Somalia, Yemen, and Pakistan, there has been significant progress. But that progress is not enough. And it's certainly not enough when resources are so painfully limited. It's absolutely essential that the government is very, very clear where its interests lie what its priorities are, and marshal the resources across government to ensure that those resources are used most effectively.